Hello, my name is Ashley Lambert, and this is Very Sleepy, a podcast to help you fall asleep. So, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and settle in for tonight's story, Darby O'Gill and the Leprechaun, from the book Darby O'Gill and the Good People by Hermione Templeton Cavanaugh. Now, I know in my last podcast, I mentioned that I was going to do a different kind of story, and then I remembered I'm Irish. My family is Irish, and it's almost St. Patrick's Day. Now, you may or may not know the reason that I started this podcast in the first place is my mother passed almost a year ago in May, and I was having trouble sleeping. And so I figured... You know, other people probably have this problem as well, especially if you're grieving or it's just noisy or you're stressed out. So I I hope it's helping. But to honor my Irish mother and our clans of Mullen and Murphy, I figured I would switch gears and do something that was more Irish. Hermione Cavanaugh was the daughter of Major George McGibney of Longford, Ireland. She became Hermione Templeton after her first marriage to John Templeton and Hermione Templeton Cavanaugh after her second marriage. Now, she was Irish, but her second husband, Marcus Cavanaugh, was a Cook County judge in Chicago, Illinois from 1898 to 1935. Her best known work is Darby O'Gill and the Good People. Now, you might have heard of Darby O'Gill and the Little People, which was a Disney movie. And Sean Connery, the late, great Sean Connery, was in that movie as well. And it came or was based off of her book. So I'm going to do one of the stories, Darby O'Gill and the Leprechaun. But it is, it's a really good book. It's her best known work. Now, let's talk about St. Patrick's Day a little bit and some of the things that we associate as in the Leprechaun, was classified as a solitary fairy by the writer and amateur folklorist William Butler Yeats, who I definitely have a great affinity to. He was part of the revivalist literary movement, greatly influential in calling attention to the Leprechaun specifically in the late 19th century. Now, that classification was derived from D.R. McAnally, Irish Wonders, 1888, derived in turn from John O'Hanlon in 1870. It's stressed that the leprechaun, although some may call them a fairy, is clearly to be distinguished from the good people of the fairy mounds and the wraths. Leprechaun being a solitary fairy or one distinguishing characteristic, but additionally, the leprechaun is thought to only engage in pranks on the level of mischief and requiring special caution. But in contrast, the wraths may carry out deeds more menacing to humans, as in the spiriting away of children. According to Yeats, the great wealth of these fairies comes from the treasure crocs buried of old in wartime, which they have uncovered and appropriated. According to David Russell McAnally, the leprechaun is the son of an evil spirit and a degenerate fairy and is not wholly good nor wholly bad. According to Yeats, the solitary fairies, like the leprechauns, wear red jackets, whereas the trooping fairies wear green, which doesn't exactly align with our practices on St. Patty's Day. The universal leprechaun is described as about being three feet high and is dressed in a little red jacket or roundabout with red breeches, buckled at the knee, gray or black stockings, and a hat, cocked in the style of a century ago, over a little old withered face. Round his neck is an Elizabethan ruff, and frills of lace are at his wrists. On the wild west coast, where the Atlantic winds bring almost constant rains, he dispenses with ruff and frills, and wears an overcoat over his red suit, so that, unless on the lookout for a cocked hat, ye might pass a leprechaun on the road, and never know it's himself that's in it at all. As far as St. Patrick's Day is concerned, St. Patrick was a Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Much of what is known about St. Patrick comes from the Declaration, which was allegedly written by Patrick himself. 
It is believed that he was born in Roman Britain in the 4th century into a wealthy Romano-British family. His father was a deacon, and his grandfather was a priest in the Christian church. According to the declaration, at the age of 16, he was kidnapped by Irish raiders and taken to Gaelic Ireland. It says he spent six years there working as a shepherd, and during this time, he found his Christianity. The declaration says that God told Patrick to flee to the coast, where a ship would be waiting to take him home. After making his way home, Patrick went on to become a priest. According to tradition, Patrick returned to Ireland to convert the pagan Irish to Christianity. And the declaration says that he spent many years evangelizing in the northern half of Ireland and converted thousands. Now, where does the shamrock come into play? Well, according to legend, St. Patrick used the three-leaved shamrock to explain the Holy Trinity to Irish pagans. His efforts were eventually turned into an allegory in which he drove snakes out of Ireland, despite the fact that snakes were not known to inhabit that region. Tradition holds that he died on March 17th and was buried at Downpatrick. Over the following centuries, many legends grew up around Patrick, and he became Ireland's foremost saint. Patrick is remembered in the Church of England and on March 17th. And we call it St. Patrick's Day. With that being said, get ready for Darby O'Gill and the Leprechaun from the book Darby O'Gill and the Good People. One thing to be aware of is that this story was written by a true Irish, and sometimes the spellings and pronunciations may not necessarily sound correct, or I might not do them a good service, so bear with my uh, Irish pronunciations. The news that Darby O'Gill had spent six months with the good people spread fast and far and wide. At fair or market, he would be back to be a crowd again, against a wall, and there for hours, men, women, and children, with jaws a-droppin' and the eyes a-bulgin', stand furnished him, listening to half-frightened questions, or to bold, mysterious answers. Anyway, though one bit of wise advice indeed, his disgorge, neither make nor meddle with the fairies, Darby'd say. If you're going along the lonely boreen at night, and you hear from some fairy fort a sound of fiddles, or of piping, or of sweet voices singing, or of little feet pattering in the dance, don't turn your head, but say your prayers and hold on your way. The pleasures the good people will share with you have a sore sorrow hid in them, and the gifts they'll offer are only made to break hearts with. Things went this way away, till one day in the market, over among the cows, Martin Cavanaugh, the schoolmaster, a cross-faced, argivying old man he was, contradicted Darby pint blank. "'Say a bit,' said Martin, catching Darby by the coat collar. "'You forgot about the little fairy cobbler, the leprechaun,' he says. "'You can't deny that to catch a leprechaun is great luck entirely, if one only fixed the glance of his eye on the cobbler.' That looks makes the fairy a prisoner. One can do anything with him as long as a human look covers the little lad and he'll give you the favors of three wishes to buy his freedom. At that, Darby, smiling high and knowledgeable, made answer over the heads of the crowd. God help you since, honest man, he says, around the favors of them. Same three wishes is a bog of threats and cajoleries and conditions that'll defiest the wisest. First of all, if the look be taken from the little cobbler for as much as the wink of an eye, he's gone forever, he says. Man alive, even when he does grant the favors of the three wishes, you're not safe. For if you tell anyone you've seen the leprechaun, the favors melt like snow. Or if you make a fourth wish that day, whiff, they turn to smoke. Take my advice, neither make moil nor meddle with the fairies. Through for ye, spoke up long Pither McCarthy, siding in with Darby. Didn't Barney McBride, on his way to early mass one May morning, catch the fairy cobbler sewing and a-workin' under a hedge? Have a pinch of snuff, Barney agree, said the leprechaun, handing up the little snuff-box. But mind ye, when my poor Barney bit to take a thumb and finger full of what did the little villain do but fling the box, snuff and all, into Barney's face. And then... 
Whilst the poor lad was winking and blinking, the leprechaun gave one leap and was lost in the reeds. Then again, there was Peggy O'Rourke, who captured him fair and square in a hawthorn bush. In spite of his wiles, she wrung from him the favors of the three wishes, knowing, of course, that if she told anyone of what happened to her, the spell was broken, and the wishes wouldn't come true. She hurried home, aching and longing, to, in some way, find from her husband Andy what wishes she'd make. Throwing open her door, she said, "'What would ye wish for most in the world, Andy, dear? "'Tell me, and your wish'll come true,' says she. "'A peddler was crying his wares out in the lane. "'Lanterns, tin lanterns!' cried the peddler. "'I wish I had one of them lanterns,' said Andy, careless, "'and bending over to get a coal for his pipe, "'when, lo and behold, there was a lantern in his hand. "'Well, so vexed was Peggy that one of her fine wishes should be wasted on a paltry tin lantern that she lost all patience with him. "'Why then, bad scran to you?' says she, not minding her own words. "'I wish the lantern was fastened to the end of your nose.' The word wasn't well out of her mouth till the lantern was hung, swinging from the end of Andy's nose, in a way that the wit of man couldn't loosen. It took the third and last of Peggy's wishes to release Andy. "'Look at that now!' cried a dozen voices from the admiring crowd. Darby said so from the first. Well, after a time, people used to come from miles around to see Darby and sit under the straw stack beside the stable to advise with our harrow about the most important business, what was the best time for the setting of hens, and what was a good cure colic in children, and things like that. Any man so persecuted with admiration and herification might easily find his chest swell out a bit, so it's no wonder that Darby set himself up for a knowledgeable man. He took to talking slow, and shut in one eye when he listened, and he walked with a knowledgeable twist. He grew monstrously fond of fairs and public gatherings where people made much of him, and he lost every ounce of liking he ever had for hard work. Things went on with him in this way from bad to worse, and where it would have, indeed, no man knows, if one unlucky morning he had refused to bring in the krill of turf his wife Bridget had asked him to fetch her. The unfortunate man said it was no work for the likes of him. The last word was still on Darby's lips when he realized his mistake, and he had given the world to have that saying back again. For a minute, you could have heard a pin drop. Bridget, instead of being in a hurry to begin at him, was cruel deliberate. She planted herself at the door, her two fists on her hips, and her lips shut. The look Julia Sayers trow at a servant girl he caught stealing sugar from the rile cupboard was the glance she waved up and down from Darby's toes to his head, and from his head to his brogues again. Then she began and talked steady as a fall of hail that has now and then a bit of lightning and thunder mixed in. The knowledgeable man stood pretending to brush his hat and trying to look brave, but the heart inside him was melting like butter. Bridget began easily and carelessly mentioning a few of Darby's best-known weaknesses. After that, she took up some of them, not so well known, being one's Darby himself, had serious doubts about having it all. But on those last, she was more severe than the first, though it all he daren't say a word. He only smiled, lofty and bitter. "'Twas but natural next for Bridget to explain what a poor character her husband was on the day she got him, and what she might have been if she had married another one of those six others who had axed her. The step for her was a little one thin to the shortcomings and misfortunes of his blood relations, which she followed back to the plagiarisms of his fourth cousin, Philip McFadden. Even in his misery, poor Darby couldn't but marvel at her wonderful memory. By the time she began talking of her own family, and especially about her aunt Honoria O'Shaughnessy, who had once shook hands with a bishop, and who, in the rebellion of ninety-eight, had thrown a brick at the Lord Liffinant when he was riding by, Darby was as wilted and as forlorn-looking as a rooster caught out in the winter rain. He lost more pride in those few moments than it had taken months to gather and hoard. 
It kept falling in great drops from his forehead. Just as Bridget was ladling up to what Father Cassidy calls a puroration, that being the part of your wife's discourse when, after telling you all she's done for you, and all she stood from your relations, she breaks down and cries and so smothers you entirely, just as she was coming that, I say. Darby scrouged his carbon down on his head, stuck his fingers in his two ears, and making one grand rush through the door, bolted as fast as his legs could carry him down the road toward the mountains. Bridget stood on the step looking after him, too surprised for a word. With his fingers still in his ears so that he could not hear her commands to turn back, he ran without stopping till he came to the willow tree near Joey Hooligan's forge. There he slowed down to fill his lungs with the fresh sweet air. It was one of those warm-hearted, laughing autumn days which steals for a while the bonnet and shawl of the May. The sun from the sky of feathery whiteness leaned over, telling jokes to the world, and the gold harvest fields and purple hills, lazy and contented, laughed back at the sun. Even the blackbird flying over the haw tree looked down and sang to those below. And Lynette from her bow answered back quick and sweet. With such pleasant sights and sounds and twitterings at every side, our hero didn't feel time passing till he was on top of the first hill of the mountains, which, as everyone knows, is called Pig's Head. It wasn't quite lonesome enough on the Pig's Head, so our hero plunged into the valley and climbed the second mountain, the Devil's Pillow, where he was lonesome and deserted enough to shut anyone. Beneath the shade of a tree, for the day was warm, he sat himself down on the long, sweet grass, lit his pipe, and let his mind go free. But as he did, his thoughts rose together like a flock of frightened, angry pheasants, and weird back to the audacious things Bridget had said about his relations. Wasn't she just the woman, he thought, to say such things as elegant stock as the O'Gills and the O'Grady's? Why, Willem O'Gill, Darby's uncle, at that minute was head butler at Castle Brophy, and was known far and wide as being one of the finest scholars, and as having the most beautiful pair of legs in all of Ireland. This same Willem O'Gill had told Bridget in Darby's own hearing, on a day when the three were going through the great picture gallery at Castle Brophy, that the O'Gills at one time had been kings in Ireland. Darby never since could remember whether this time was before the flood or after the flood. Bridget said it was during the flood, but surely that saying was nonsense. However, Darby knew his uncle Willem was right, for he often felt in himself the signs of greatness, and now, as he sat alone on the grass, he said out loud, "'If I had me rights, I'd be doing nothing all day long but sitting on a throne and playing games of forty-five with me lord.' my lord lieutenant, and maybe some of me generals. There never was a lord that liked good eating or drinking, nor I who hates worse to get up airily in the morning. That last dislike, I'm told, is a great sign entirely of gentle blood the world over, says he. As for his wife's people, the O'Hagans and the O'Shaughnessys, well, they were no great shakes, he said to himself. At last, so far as looks were concerned, all the handsomeness in Darby's childhood came from his own side of the family. Even Father Cassidy said, the child look after the O'Gills. If I were rich, said Darby to a lazy old bumblebee who was droning on and tumbling in front of him, I'd have a castle like Castle Brophy, with a great picture gallery in it. On one wall, I'd put the pictures of the O'Gills and the O'Gradys, and on the wall from them, I'd have the O'Higgins and the O'Shaughnessys. At that idea, his heart bubbled in new and fierce delight. Bridget's people, he says again, scowling at the bee, would look four times as common as they rarely are, when they were compared in that way with my own relations, and whenever Bridget got rampageous, I'd take her in and show her the difference betwixt the two clans just to punish her, so I would. How long the lad sat that way, warming the cold thoughts of his heart with drowsy pleasant rhymes and misty longings, he didn't rightly know when tack tack came the busy sound of a little hammer from the other side of a fallen oak. "'Be Jingo,' he says to himself with a start, "'tis the leprechaun that's in it.' In a second, he was on his hands and knees, the tails of his coat flung across his back, and he crawling softly toward the sound of the hammer, 
Quiet as a mouse, he lifted himself up on the mossy log to look over, and there, before his two popping eyes, was a sight of wonderation. Sitting on a white stone and working away like fury hammering pegs into a little red shoe, half the size of your thumb, was a bald-headed old cobbler about twice the height of your hand. On the top of a round, snubbed nose was perched a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles and a narrow fringe of iron-gray whiskers grew under his stubby chin. The brown leather apron he wore was so long that it covered his green knee breeches and almost hid the knitted gray stockings. The leprechaun, for he was indeed, as he worked, mumbled and muttered in great discontent. "'Oh, haven't I the hard, hard luck,' he said. I will never have them done in time for her to dance in tonight, so then I'll be killed entirely, says he. Was there ever another queen of the fairies, as wearing on shoes and brogues and dancing slippers? Haven't I the... Looking up, he saw Darby. The top of the day to you, decent man, says the cobbler, jumping up. Given a sharp cry, he pointed quickly at Darby's stomach. But where, where, where's that woolly, ugly thing you have crawling and creeping on your whiskert? he said, pretending to be all excited. "'Saw a thing on my waistcoat,' answered Darby, cool as ice, "'or anywhere else that'll make me take my two bright eyes off on you, not for a second, says he. "'Well, well, well, we look at that now,' laughed the cobbler. "'Mark how quick and handy he took me up. Will you have a pinch of snuff, clever man?' he asked, holding up a little box. "'Is that the same snuff you gave to Barney McBride a while ago?' asked Darby, sarcastic. Lave off your foolishness, he says, our harrow growing fierce, and grant me at once the favors of the three wishes, or I'll have you smoking like a herring in my own chimney before nightfall, says he. At that, the leprechaun, seeing he but wasted time on so knowledgeable a man as Darby O'Gill, surrendered and granted the favors of the three wishes. What is it that you ask? says the cobbler, himself turning on a sudden very sour and sullen. First and foremost, says Darby, I want a home of my ancestors, and it must be a castle like Castle Brophy, with pictures of my kith and kin on the wall, and then facing them pictures of my wife Bridget's kith and kin on the other wall. That favor I give you, that wish I grant ye, said the leprechaun, making the shape of a castle on the ground with his awl. What next? he grunted. I want gold enough for me and my generations to enjoy the grandeur of the place forever. "'Always the gold,' sneered the little man, "'bending to draw with his awl on the turf the shape of a purse. "'Now, for your third and last wish, have a care. "'I want the castle set on this hill, the devil's pillow, where we two stand,' says Darby. "'Then sweeping with his arm, he says, "'I want the land, about, to be my domain.' "'The leprechaun struck his awl on the ground. "'That wish I give you, that wish I grant you.' With that, he straightened himself up and, grinning, most aggravating the while, he looked at Darby over from top to toe. "'You're a fine, knowledgeable man, but have a care of the fourth wish,' says he. Because there was more of a challenge than friendly warning in what the small lad said, Darby snapped his fingers at him and cried, "'Have no fear, little man. If I got all Ireland ground for making a fourth wish, however small, before midnight, I'd not make it.' I'm going home now to fetch Bridget and the children, and the only fear unease I have is that you will not keep your word, so as to have the castle here ready before us when I come back. Oh, I'm not to be trusted, ain't I? screeched the little lad, flaring into a blazing passion. He jumped upon the log that was betwixt them, and with one fist behind his back shook the other at Darby. You ignorant, auspicious-minded blaggart! says he. How dare the likes of you say the likes of that to the likes of me? cried the cobbler. I'd have you know, he says, that I had a reputation for truth and veracity, equal, if not superior, to the best before you were born, he shouted. I'll take no high talk from a man that's afraid to give words to his own wife when she's in a tantrum, says the leprechaun. It's easy to know you're not a married man, says Darby, mighty scornful, because if you... The lad stopped short, forgetting what he was going to say in his surprise and aggravation, 
for the far side of the mountain was waving up and down before his eyes like a great green blanket that is being shook by two women, while at the same time high spots of turf on the hillside toppled sideways to level themselves up with the low places. The enchantment had already begun to make things ready for the castle. A dozen fine trees that stood in a little grove bent their heads quickly together, and then, by some invisible hand, they were plucked up by the roots and dropped aside, much the same as a man might grasp a handful of weeds and fling them from his garden. The ground under the knowledgeable man's feet began to rumble and heave. He waited for no more. With a cry that was half of gladness and half of fear, he turned on his heel and started to run down into the valley, leaving the little cobbler standing on the log shouting abuse after him and badly ragging him as he ran. So excited was Darby that, going up the pig's head, he was nearly run over by a crowd of great brown building stones which were moving slow and orderly like a flock of driven sheep, but they moved without so much as bruising a blade of grass or bend in a twig as they came. Only once, and that at the top of the pig's head, he threw a look back. The devil's pillow was in great commotion. A whirlwind was sweeping over it. Whether of dust or of mist, he could not tell. After this, Darby never looked back again, or to the right or to the left of him, but kept straight on till he found himself panting and puffing at his own kitchen door. "'Twas ten minutes before he could spake, but at last when he told Bridget to make herself ready and the children to go up to the devil's pillow with him, for once in her life that remarkable woman without asking, "'How comes it so? What reason have you? Or why should I do it?' set to work washing the children's faces. Maybe she dabbed a little more soap in their eyes than was needful, for twas a habit she had. Though this time, if she did, not a whimper broke from the little Hayrus. For the matter of that, not one word, good, bad, or indifferent, did herself spake, till the whole family were trudging down the lane two by two, marching like soldiers. As they came near the first hill, along its sides, the evening twilight turned from purple to brown, and at the top of the pig's head, the darkness of a black night swooped suddenly down on them. Darby hurried on a step or two ahead, and resting his hand upon the large rock that crowns the hill, looked anxiously over to the devil's pillow. Although he was ready for something fine, yet the greatness of the fineness that met his gaze knocked the breath out of him. Across the deep valley and on top of the second mountain, he saw lined up against the evening sky the roof of an immense castle, with towers and parapets and battlements, under the towers a thousand sullen windows glowed red in the black walls. Castle Brophy couldn't hold a candle to it. Behold, says Darby, flinging out his arms and turning to his wife, who had just come up, behold the castle of my ancestors, who were my forefathers. How? says Bridget, quick and scornful. How could your sisters be your forefathers? What Darby was going to say to her, he don't just remember, for at that instant from the right-hand side of the mountain came a cracking of whips, a rattling of wheels, and the rush of horses, and lo and behold, a great coach with flashing lamps, and drawn by four coal-black horses, dashed up the hill and stopped beside them. Two shadowy men were on the driver's box. "'Is this the Lord Darby O'Gill?' asked one of them in a deep, muffled voice. Before Darby could reply, Bridget took the words out of his mouth. "'It is,' she cried, in kind of a half-cheer, and Lady O'Gill and the children. "'Then hurry up,' says the coachman. "'Your supper's getting cold.' Without waiting for anyone, Bridget flung open the carriage door and, pushing Darby aside, jumped in among the cushions. Darby, his heart sizzling with vexation at her audaciousness, lifted in one after the other of the children, and then got in himself. He couldn't understand at all the change in his wife, for she had always been the orderliest and modest woman in the parish. Well, he'd no sooner shut the door than crack went the whip, the horses gave a spring, and the carriage jumped, and down the hill they went. For fastness, there was never another carriage ride like that, before nor since. Darby held tight with both hands to the window, his face pressed against the glass. 
He couldn't tell whether the horses were only flying or whether the coach was falling down the hill into the valley. But the hollow feeling in his stomach, he thought they were falling. He was striving to think of some prayers when there came a terrible jolt which sent his two heels against the roof and his head betwixt the cushions. As he righted himself, the wheels began to grate on a graveled road, and plainly they were dashing up the side of the second mountain. Even so, they couldn't have been gone far when the carriage drew up in a flurry, and he saw through the gloom a high iron gate being slowly opened. "'Pass on,' said a voice from somewhere in the shadows. "'Their supper's getting cold.' As they flew under the great archway, Darby had a glimpse of the thing which had opened the gate, and had said their supper was getting cold. It was standing on its hind legs in the darkness. He couldn't be quite so sure as to its shape, but it was either a bear or a lion. His mind was in a ponder about this, when, with a swirl and a bump, the carriage stopped another time, and now it stood before a bright, broad flight of stone steps, which led up the main door of the castle. Darby, half afraid, peering out through the darkness, saw a square of light high above him, which came from the open hall door. Three servants in livery stood waiting on the threshold. "'Make haste, make haste!' says one in a doleful voice, their supper's getting cold. Hearing these words, Bridget immediately bounced out and was halfway up the steps before Darby could catch her and hold her till the children came on. I never in all my life saw her so audacious, he says half crying and linking her arm to keep her back and then with the children following two by two according to size, the whole family paraded up the steps till Darby with a gasp of delight, stopped on the threshold of a splendid hall. From a high ceiling hung great flags from every nation and domination, which swung and swayed in the dazzling light. Two lines of men and maidservants dressed in silks and satins and brocades stood facing each other, bowing and smiling and waving their hands in welcome. The two lines stretched it down to the gold stairway at the far end of the hall. For half of one minute, Darby, every eye in his head as big as a teacup, stood hesitating. Then he said, Why should it flutter me? Are, aren't it all mine? Aren't all these people in me pay? I'll engage it is a pretty penny all this grandeur is costing me to keep up this minute. He threw out his chest. Come on, Bridget, he says. Let us go into the home of my ancestors. How endeavor scarcely he had stepped into the beautiful place, when two pipers with their pipes, two fiddlers with their fiddles, two flute players with their flutes, and they dressed in scarlet and gold, stepped out in front of him, and thus, to a melodious music, the family proudly marched down the hall, climbed up the golden stairway, and at its end and then turned to enter the biggest room Darby had ever seen. Something in his soul whispered that this was the picture gallery. "'Be the powers of Puther,' says the knowledgeable man to himself. "'I wouldn't be in Bridget's place this minute for a hatful of money. "'Wait, oh, just wait, till she has to compare her own relations with my own fine people. "'I know how she'll feel, but I wonder what she'll say,' he says. "'The thought that all the unjust things, all the unreasonable things "'Bridget had said about his kith and kin were just going to be disproved "'and turned against her made him proud and almost happy.' But, where's true, he should have remembered his own advice not to make, nor moil, nor meddle with the fairies, for here he was to get the first hard welt from the little leprechaun. It was the picture gallery, sure enough, but how terribly different everything was from what the poor lad expected. There, on the wall, grand and noble, shone the pictures of Bridget's people, of all the well-dressed, handsome, proud-appearing persons in the whole world, the O'Hagans and the O'Shaughnessys were to compare with the best. This was a hard enough crack, though a harder knock was to come. Looking on the right wall, glowered the O'Gills and the O'Gradys, and of all the ragged, sheep-stealing, hangdog-looking villains one ever saw, in jail or out of jail, it was Darby's kindred. The place of honor on the right wall was given to Darby's fourth cousin, Fellow McFadden, and he was painted with a pair of handcuffs on him. Willem O'Gill had a squint in his right eye, and his thin legs bowed like hoops on a barrel. If you have ever at night 
been groping your way through a dark room and got a sudden hard bump on the forehead from the edge of the door, you can understand the feelings of the knowledgeable man. Take that picture out, he said hoarsely as soon as he could speak, and will someone kindly introduce me to the man who made it? Because, he said, I intend to take his life. There was never a crass-eyed O'Gill since the world began, says he. Think of his horror and surprise when he saw the left eye of Willem O'Gill twist itself slowly over toward his nose and squint worse than the right eye. Pretended not to see this and hoping no one else did, Darby fiercely led the way over to the other wall. Fronting him stood the handsome picture of Honoria O'Shaughnessy, and she dressed in a suit of tin clothes like the knights of old used to wear. Armor, I think they called it. She had a spear in her hand with a little flag on the blade, and her smile was proud and high. "'Take that likeness out, too,' says Darby, very spiteful. "'That is not a decent suit of clothes for any woman to wear.' The next minute you might have knocked him down with a feather, for the picture of Honoria O'Shaughnessy opened its mouth and stuck out its tongue at him. "'The supper's getting cold,' someone cried at the other end of the picture gallery. Two big doors were swung open, and glad enough was our poor hero to follow the musicians down to the room where the aten and drinkin' were to be transacted. This was a little room with lots of looking-glasses, and it was bright, with a thousand candles and white, with the shiningest marble. On the table was built beef and radishes, and carrots and roast mutton, and all kinds of important eating and drinking. Besides those stood fruits and sweets, and, but, sure, what is the use in talking? A high-backed chair stood ready for the head of the family, and t'was a lovely sight to see them all when they were sitting there, Darby at the head, Bridget at the foot, and the children, the poor little patriarchs, sitting bolt upright on each side, with a bewiggled and befrilled serving man standing haughty behind every chair. The eating and drinking would have begun at once, and troth, there was already a bit of biled beef on Darby's plate, only when he spied a little silver bell beside him. Sure, t'was one of those the quality kept to ring when they want more hot water for their punch, but it puzzled the knowledgeable man, and t'was the beginning of his misfortune. "'I wonder,' he thought, "'if tis here for the same reason as the bell is at the Curragh races. Do they ring this one?' so that all at the table will start eating and drinking fair, and no one will have the advantage? Or is it, he says to himself again, to ring when the head of the house thinks everyone has had enough? Haven't the quality queer ways. It'll be a long time learning them, he says. He sat silent and puzzling and staring at the beef on his plate, feared to start in without ringing the bell, and dreading the risk to ringing it. The grand servants towered coldly on every side, their chins tilted, but they kept throwing over their shoulders glances so scornful and haughty that Darby shivered at the thought of showing any uncultivation. While our hero sat thus in uneasy contemplation and smoldering mortification, a flurid hesitation a powdered head was poked over his chowder, and a soft beguiling voice said, "'Is there anything else you'd wish for?' The foolish lad twisted in his chair, opened his mouth to spake, and looked at the bell. Shame rushed to his cheeks. He picked up a bit of the biled beef on his fork, and to console his trepidation, gave the misfortunate answer. "'I wish for a pinch of salt, if you please,' says he. "'Twas no sooner said than came the crash. O thunderation, O murderation, what a roaring crash it was! The lights winked out together at a breath, and left a pitchy, throbbing darkness. Overhead and to the sides was a roaring, smashing, crunching noise, like the ocean's madness when the wintry storm breaks again on the Kiri shore, and in that roar was mingled the tearing and the splitting of the walls and the falling of the chimneys. But though in all this confusion could be heard the shrill laughing voice of the leprechaun, the clever man made his fourth grand wish, it howled. Darby, a thousand wild voices screaming and mocking above him, was on his back, kicking and squirming and striving to get up, but some load held him down and something else bound his eyes shut. "'Are you killed, Bridget?' he cried. "'Where are the children?' he says. Instead of answer, there was suddenly flashed a fierce and angry silence, and its quickness frightened the lad more than all the wild confusion before.' 
"'Twas a full minute before he dared to open his eyes to face the horrors which he felt were standing about him. But when courage enough to look came, all he saw was the night-covered mountain, a purple sky and a thin new moon, with one trembling gold star, a hand's space, above its bosom. Darby struggled to get to his feet. Not a stone of the castle was left, not a sod of turf, but what was in its old place, every sign of the little cobbler's work, had melted like April snow. The very trees Darby had seen, pulled up by the roots that same afternoon, now stood a waving blur below the new moon, and a nightingale was singing in their branches. A cricket chirped lonesomely on the same fallen log which had hidden the leprechaun. Bridget, Bridget, Darby called again and again. Only a sleeping owl on a distant hill answered. A shivering thought jumped into his bewildered soul. Maybe the leprechaun had stolen Bridget and the children. The poor man turned and for the last time darted down into the night-filled wally. Not a pool in the road he waited to go around, not a ditch in his path he did not leap over, but ran as he never ran before until he reached his own front door. His heart stood still as he peeped through the window. There were the children, cuddled around Bridget, who sat with the youngest asleep in her lap before the fire, rocking back and forth, and she crooning a happy, contented baby song. Tears of gladness crept into Darby's eyes as he looked in upon her. "'God bless her,' he says to himself. "'She's the flower of the O'Higgins and the O'Shaughnessys, "'and she's a proud feather in the caps of the O'Gills and the O'Grady's. "'Twas well that he had this happy thought to cheer him "'as he lifted the door latch, "'for the meanest of all the little cobbler's spiteful tricks "'waited in the house to meet Darby. "'Neither Bridget nor the children "'remembered a single thing of all that had happened to them during the day.' They were willing to make their happy days that they had been no further than their own petri patch since morning. The end. I hope you enjoyed the story of Darby O'Gill and the Leprechaun. I hope it made you very, very sleepy. Thank you so much for all the downloads and the reviews. We were all amazing. I appreciate it so much. If you're new here, Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Keep an ear out for next week's story, The Magic Rice Pot. You know the story I was supposed to do this week, but changed my mind. So happy St. Patty's Day. I wish you the luck of the Irish in all that you do. I'm Ashley Lambert, and this is Very Sleepy. Until next time, good night.